Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the book of Hebrews and all the great guidance, God, that this book gives our lives. I pray, God, that you help us now to be able to enter in. And Lord, may the words spring forth from the page and into our hearts. And may, God, you use them to inspire us, to, to stimulate us, God, to growing in you in 2020. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's been 21 days. 21 days since we last heard a message from the book of Hebrews. We have about two months left in our series through this book. And we resume it today. We're in Hebrews chapter 10. If you want to follow along, you can do that. We'll also have the words on the screen. I want to remind us, since it's been a little while, the premise of this book. This book was written by an author who was writing to a group of Hebrew Christians, people who had a Jewish root. They had an understanding of the Old Testament. They had become believers not long after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And at first it appears that they were really following Jesus Christ well. By the time of this letter, maybe 20 to 30 years later, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and it seems as though the author got a report that these people were beginning to slip. That the love that they had for Jesus at first was no longer as strong as in the beginning. And he was writing to spur them on, to encourage them, to keep going in their journey of faith. One of the things that you see a lot in the book of Hebrews is warning. It's a New Testament book that's filled with probably more warnings than any other New Testament book. The picture that you get in the book of Hebrews, and we'll see it a little bit today, is that faith is not just a one-time thing. It's not just a one-day decision, but that it's a lifelong journey. And in, in, in Hebrews, the author has the importance he's instilling into us that that faith journey continues all the way until the end. We'll see that today. Another significant understanding that leads us into what we're going to be discussing today is the presence of God in the Old Testament, the way it was for an Old Testament Jew, and the presence of God and the way it's supposed to be for a New Testament Christian. I want to revisit that for a moment as we head into our lesson in verse 23 of Hebrews today. Here's a story in summary about the presence of God. First of all, Adam and Eve were in a garden. Where was God when Adam and Eve were in the garden? Where was the presence of God, do you recall? He was with them. So God was with Adam and Eve in the garden. That's God's design, and you know that's the way that God's going to get it in the end. You know that God's going to be with us again? The whole Bible is really a, 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 a bookend. We began with him in the beginning, and we're going to return to be with him again. Hallelujah. But after sin of Adam and Eve, they were banned from the garden. Because a holy God and sinful people don't mix. And actually, there was a sword that was put guarding the garden from God's people re-entering because of the fact that they had sinned. And now there was a barrier between God and his relationship with his people because of sin. You may recall a couple of weeks ago as we were discussing Hebrews and looking back to the book of Exodus, Moses was asked to come up onto the mountain and God was going to begin to give the law to Moses. But he gave several warnings to Moses. He said, Moses, tell the people, they can come to the base of the mountain, but they can't come any further. If they try to come up the mountain to where you are, they, they'll be destroyed. So warn them, Moses. Warn them to stay at the base. Now, they were going to be able to see the activity of God with Moses up on the mountain. When Moses and then Aaron were acting as his high priest. See, they, as priests, had a position that allowed them to draw near to the presence of God than the common man. The common man, at this point in history, still had a distance because of sin and their relationship with God. After this time, through the law, God developed a way with sinful man to come nearer than he had prior. And that way was through the tabernacle. The tabernacle was, first of all, a fence-like structure 
like a rectangle. And then inside that big rectangle courtyard was a tent. And inside the tent, there were two chambers, a holy place and a most holy place. This structure was set up in the middle of the camp of the Israelites. They were instructed by their family lineage where their position would be to camp all the way around the tabernacle so that they were the open door of their tent was facing the tabernacle. It was a way for God to come near so that they would know that he was with them. God's presence was made manifest over the most holy place of the tabernacle, and there was a smoke and fire that came so that people could see that God's presence existed in the tabernacle. It was a way of God drawing near. But man had a boundary between him and God that we've been discussing this morning and in this series. And it, the boundary is represented by that fence because the Israelite needed to stay outside that fence. Only a priest could come inside the fence area of the tabernacle and only the priest could go into the holy place and only the high priest could go into the most holy place and he could only go in that place where the direct presence of God was one day a year. That is the understanding that the author of Hebrews has been reviewing with the audience of this letter. And then, in chapter 10, he gets to the climax of the letter of Hebrews. And it's in Hebrews 10, verses 18 through 22. Let's turn there now. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. What's being said here is now through the forgiveness in Jesus being the final offer for sin, there's no longer any offering like we would bring to the entrance of the tabernacle in the past because God sent his son to be the once and for all final offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, now, in our common human understanding today, without the backdrop of what we just talked about, we can read a passage like this and not see the enormity of what's being said. What's being said here is that the presence of God that only existed before in the tabernacle, in the most holy place, has now been made available to you and I. And in fact, today... Who is the tabernacle or the temple of the Lord? Where is his Holy Spirit that only rested before in the most holy place? Now the Holy Spirit is in you and I. God doesn't need a man-made tabernacle or a man-made temple, at least in this era right now. One day he's going to restore that again in a heavenly Jerusalem. But for now, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, is you and I. It's echoed by this, listen to this, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Do you recall that there was this huge temple in Jerusalem, and in the divider between the holy place and most holy place was a veil, which was 33 feet tall, so no one could reach it. But when Jesus died on the cross, God, in trueness and in symbolism, had that veil torn. Because what it symbolizes, that torn veil that happened at the death of Jesus, is that now we have access into that most holy place, which is being referenced here in Hebrews. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, and here it is, let us draw near. We were near in the garden. We could only come so near after that. But now through the blood of Jesus, we are able to draw near because his Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean like they used to sprinkle the blood on the altar for the forgiveness of sins, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed just like the priests would wash before they would enter the holy place. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus, and that's why we can have access to God, not because we're sinless, but because we've been perfectly forgiven by the death of Jesus on the cross. 
And this has even greater implications than what I've mentioned so far. Because now, the hierarchy is gone. Do you notice that in the New Testament, there's no reference to priests anymore? There's no middleman anymore. I am not a priest. And I am not a middleman. What I'm trying to do now is help all of you to see that, you know what? God is in you. And you can go directly to Him. Hey, I want to help you. And I need your help as too because I'm you and you're me. But now we can all just go directly to God. We don't need a pope. We don't need a bishop. And we don't need a priest. And in fact, God didn't make any more of them in the New Testament. Those words are no longer used. We're disciples. We're ambassadors. In fact, the only way that the word priest is used, as you guys know from being in this series, is that we're a kingdom of priests. All of us. Hey, who had access to the presence of God in the Old Testament? The priest. Who has access to God's presence now? Us. Guess what that means? And what the Bible echoes is that we are a kingdom of priests. It's a totally new understanding that the author of Hebrews has unveiled to these Hebrew Christians. That's the backdrop of Hebrews, where it leads to us now in Hebrews 10, verse 23. So let's dig into that now. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And now the longing of the author to the people, the recipients of this letter, is that everything that you've been taught, that, that you would be filled with hope and that it wouldn't waver, that you would continue strong in everything that you've learned, that it wouldn't, you wouldn't fall away. And that was the very concern that he had of this audience that he was sending the letter to, that they've learned these marvelous things, but are they going to continue in them? Or are they going to begin, begin to drift away? The word there, hold fast, is the word katecho in Greek, and it refers to a ship's headway. You may recall lessons on this in the past, but I want to review it because it's so powerful. Imagine for a moment if you were traveling from here to Europe, across the sea, and you were going to do it in a ship. And by the way, you don't have your iPhone and you don't have a GPS. Now picture just looking out at over an ocean. How do you guide yourself? There's nothing to guide yourself other than really the sun. But what they came up with, with the sun, but also with a dial, is a big dial that has degrees written on it. There's 365 degrees. And the degree would be your heading. So you would know if I'm leaving New York and I'm heading to London, you would know what degree it is to get there, where you need to keep the dial on your ship. And as a result of that, when you're traveling across the ocean and you can't look at trees and mountains and all that, you would have to make sure that you're steering the ship directly on that heading, it's called, or if you want the professional term, that azimuth. You'd have to make sure that you didn't deviate because if you were to deviate even two degrees over, say, a thousand miles, you would be far off from your destination. So what's being said here about holding fast is to keep Jesus and our faith and our hope in him and all that we've learned front and center so that we don't get off track and so that we don't drift off course. And that's actually our human tendency. Our human tendency is that we, we, we can so easily drift. Uh, we, John and I were talking about that song earlier, uh, Prone to Wander. There's a song where the lyrics are prone to wander, and, and the song's about you know, not wandering. But we, we are, as humans, prone to wander. And because the author knew of that, today he gives us advice to help us to not wander. Here it is. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. The word stir up is to stimulate or to incite. Church, I don't know about you. It, some days you just kind of might wake up and you might be like, man, what am I here for? Why does life matter? What is my purpose? What do I do that actually has meaning? 
or significance. It reminds me of the passage in the book of Psalms, chapter 90, and it says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And then later in that chapter, it says, establish the work of our hands. Yes, Lord, establish the work of our hands. Brother or sister in Jesus Christ, our days are numbered. It's as though the author is saying there's a number. Like God knows the number. And everybody's got a number. But we don't know the number. I wonder sometimes if it would help us if we did. To stay motivated. To stay serving God. To place Him as of utmost importance in our lives. Our mission at this church is to equip believers to be fruitful. It echoes very much what's being said today. To stir, one another, stir up one another to love and good works. Friends, that's where our identity comes from, from our relationship with God. And that's where our purpose comes from, in serving Him. And I'm so grateful for that, that we it helps us from getting mixed up on a lot of things that don't matter in life. And we can get back to what matters. Serving God and serving people on behalf of God. That's what has eternal value. That's what's going to matter in the end before Jesus. And we need that reminder sometimes, that, that refresher to get back on track in serving God. Listen to what it says next. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Notice the capital D, day. The day that one day we're going to meet Jesus, when he comes back, or when we pass on from this earth, when our number comes up, and we need to encourage one another all the more as that day approaches. And one of the ways that we stir up one another to love and good works is that we meet together. And that we don't get sidetracked and neglect not meeting together. I have, uh, you know, we can confess our sins to God. I mean, we don't need to confess to one another, but sometimes we can confess to one another too. It doesn't mean it's wrong to confess to one another. In fact, the Bible says you can, you should confess your sins to one another. But we can go directly to God too. But anyways, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a confession to you guys. And it's weird how God works. Um, my experience in the past week when I was going to be giving this message. It's just, just of God. Uh, so, first of all, I've had a really busy couple of months. Uh, we moved. There's a lot of busyness that goes into moving. And busyness, busy, 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 busy isn't always the best for your, your journey of faith. It's just not. And I've been very busy. And I've been managing. I've been getting by. You know, it, it helps when you preach a message every week. You know, you really get in the word to, to deliver to you guys, and that, that helps keep me connected as well. So I preached, you know, a couple times on the 22nd. I preached a couple times on Christmas Eve on the 24th. And then it was Christmas Eve, and you were with family Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day you were with two different families, and my family, and then another family. And then the 26th, I left immediately for vacation. My in-laws took us on a vacation. Got up at like 4 in the morning, and we went to Florida. You guys feeling bad for me yet? <laughs> so anyways, we get in a plane, we travel to Florida, and I did open my Bible on the plane. I read one chapter, and then I watched a two-hour movie on my way to Florida, some war movie. Kind of a waste of time, but I'm kind of like, I'm on vacation, and I'm going to kick back a little bit, right? So we get there, and the first day I get up, and I usually leave early because I get up so early, and I did, I did read the Bible that day. I got sick on vacation. Uh, for two days, I really didn't get out of bed. It's kind of a bummer, right? Aw, oh, poor Jay. <laughs> but anyways, I was sick for a couple of days. Honestly, I didn't crack the Bible open for those two days on vacation and all. And it was Saturday, starting to feel a little bit better. And I said to my wife, I think I'll go to church tomorrow. Many times I do go to church on vacation. Not always, but many times I do. Well, I didn't go. So Sunday, I didn't go to church. I read the Bible one other time that week. Normally I'm in the Bible a lot more than that. So I skipped church, and I was in the Bible infrequently 
for a period of six days. I got, a fight. I got in a fight with my wife. Uh, I was impatient, more impatient. I felt in my spirit that I just wasn't right. In one week, one week of not prioritizing God and getting disconnected, <clears throat> things were beginning to change in Pastor Jack. I don't know how exactly to say this. I'm trying to say it the right way. Do you know what that's like to start drifting? I think most of you do. And praise God for that. It's actually a good thing when you recognize that you're drifting. Do you know what's worse? when you don't recognize it. Do you know that some people in their relationship with God may not get to the point that they recognize they're drifting because they're adrift? I say that with compassion. It can be a lifestyle of drifting. Some of you might be able to relate to this as it relates to exercise. For those of you who are into exercise, if you go a week without exercising, when you exercise all the time, you notice you're not exercising. If you don't exercise anyways, and you go a week without exercising, it's like, yeah, no big deal. I didn't recognize I'm not because I don't want to do it. And it can be that way spiritually too. I want to encourage all of us to continue in our journey of faith so that if we're drifting, we recognize we're drifting. So that we can get back on track. I have more to share with you in this regard, though. I've been a pastor for a decade. And before I do this, I want to I do something. Everyone, can you just put your hand up like this real quick? Quick, put it right here. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> because you, my friends, are at church today. Well done. Good job. Praise the Lord. You're doing something right. But I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Because the passage that we're looking at today is not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. I've been a pastor for a decade. I've been in ministry full time since 2004. So I'm going on whatever that is, 16 years of full-time ministry. You observe things in 16 years of full-time ministry. I want to let you know, with compassion, not judgment, but I'm trying to stir up one another to love and good works today, and stir up one another to be here. As I've seen families who are inconsistent in coming to church, and it begins with mom and dad, when mom and dad are inconsistent, their faith life can be inconsistent, their marriage can be inconsistent, and their kids many times fall suit. And they're learning from mom and dad on what it means to be inconsistent. I don't say that because I'm happy to say it. I say it because it saddens me. It saddens me when I see families get ripped apart Many times it happens because our faith is weak. When our faith is strong, it helps our marriages to come together. It helps convict us when we're going astray more quickly. It helps us to be more kind. It helps us to say things that are right instead of that are wrong. It matters staying connected to church. It matters staying connected to God. And it matters a lot. Sometimes we don't give it the credit we should. I think maybe it's pride. Maybe we think we're strong enough on our own. We can do this Christian thing on our own. And we, we, don't, we don't maybe uh, counsel ourselves well enough that we should be attending. We make up excuses. And, and friends, we go adrift. We go adrift and it has consequences. Disconnection leads to weakened faith. Weakened faith 
leads to sin. And sin leads to destruction. When you look at your life, when we look at our lives, when, when things have gone awry in our lives, it's usually because of sin. Look at your own. I think it's easy to see if we just reflect upon it. When things went awry, when there was consequences and there was negativity in my life, it was because of sin. And when there was blessing in my marriage and in my family, it was because I was following God and because there was faith. And the Bible says it'll be that way. The Bible teaches us that that very thing is true. And we need to encourage one another and we need to continue to meet together as we see the day drawing near. It'll bless us. It'll bless you. Church, I mean it. I mean it. As we, as we reconnect with God, as we draw near to Him, you will see a blessing take place in your life. You will see a blessing take place in your marriage. You're eventually, it'll take time, but you will see the example that you're setting before your kids, and they will want to follow the same example. My son's in New York now, and he works on Sundays. I was so blessed that he messaged me. He just moved out there. And he, he texted me a, a link to a church that meets on Wednesdays because he can't make it on Sundays. And I'm like, praise God, he's doing what he can to try to stay connected, although he's all on his own in New York. I have a word that I, I need to share with you because it's what's next in the scriptures. Uh, you may not like it very much, <laughs> but I'm going to read it to you now. And I want you to know that it comes on the heels of do not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. That's the prior verse as you see the day drawing near. And then we get to verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Now, some of you maybe haven't heard these verses very often. For those of you who have been going through the book of Hebrews with us, these verses have been echoed prior. In chapter 3 and in chapter 6, we hear a lot from passages like this in the book of Hebrews. It is has more distinction in this regard, but it's not on its own, but it has more distinction in this regard than other New Testament books. But other New Testament verses would echo similar words. This is troubling for some in the sense that uh, you've learned once saved, always saved, or you've learned about eternal security, and what I want to tell you is that's true. I want to tell you that I believe in election. I want to tell you that I believe in predestination. I, I do believe that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit when we believed. But I also believe everything I just read to you. Because it's the Word of God. So how do the two fit? I don't know. Anybody want to give it a shot? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't need to know. God didn't ask me to... to, to, to Reconcile everything that he has left unreconciled. I'm just going to trust his word. Now let me, let me share with you something. Why I think God is so brilliant. He's just so brilliant that he has all of these things in his word. And I want to give you a story of two people. And maybe you're one of them this morning. The first one is one who is a person of faith. They believe in Jesus can't seem to forgive themselves. They know they've done wrong. They know they sinned before they came to Jesus and they know they sinned after they come to Jesus. And they feel like they're unforgiven. And they feel like 
They can't forgive themselves. What God's word would want to tell that person is his love covers a multitude of sins. Jesus' death on a cross is big enough to forgive every, all sin for all of mankind, including yours. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that you can be forgiven and so that you can have eternal life. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let the devil keep you down thinking that Jesus' sacrifice isn't big enough to forgive you. Because it is. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. And he was a man after God's own heart. And God loves you and sent his son to forgive you. And how dare you not believe him. Right? That word and everything I just said is true. But there's another person out there. And that person has said, well, I was baptized when I was an infant. Or I came forward when I was six years old or when I was ten years old. And I went forward for an altar call. And I believe, I believe I'm living with someone outside of marriage right now. I'm doing what I want. I'm, I've got a life filled with pornography. But, but I believe, I believe. And the Lord was saying, open up your Bible. I want you to open up to Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. Stop living in deliberate disobedience to God. Yes, he died to forgive you, but not to live that way. Get back on track in serving him. And guess what? Both those messages are needed. There's people who need to hear the first one, and there's people that need to hear the second one. God's got them both in his word because it's brilliant. And he wants to give us what we need to stir us up to love and to good works. Amen? But praise God, he ends with some encouraging words. But recall the former days, he's referring to these Christians, after you were enlightened. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. You were doing good. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Hey, you were doing good. Praise God. God knows that you were doing good. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. There's great reward in believing and following Jesus. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And you see, there's the emphasis of what the author is after there. He's saying, you know what? I just want you to continue. I just want you to keep going. I just want you to keep enduring because I want you to receive everything that's promised. I want you to receive your reward. Don't go backwards. Keep moving forward in Jesus. And he believes they will. For yet a little while the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, he gives you a warning. My soul has no pleasure in him. But I believe this is said for you, church. You are the church. You're here because you believe. You're here because you believe. You're here because you want to grow in Christ. You're doing the right things by being here today and pursuing a journey with Jesus Christ. And I believe that this verse, the summation of this, is for you. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Church, may that be true of us. I believe it is. That's why we need to meet together, continue to spur one another on towards love and good works, continue to meet together to encourage one another, and together, let's follow him all the way to the end. Amen? As I close this message, I believe that these are the positive outcomes and prayerful considerations that the author is trying to instill in us that I'd like to close with today. I'd like to ask you to commit to coming to church weekly. Not, not because of me. I, I'm, 
I believe, I, I'm not asking you this, church. I'm only joining in God asking you because it's what he said today, isn't it? Did he? Do not give up the habit of meeting together. I'd ask you to commit to coming to church. Now listen, I realize sometimes you're going to be out of town. I mean, you might be so sick that you're almost dead that you can't come, but otherwise you can't come. <laughs> Anyways, I want, to, I want you to try to commit to being here. And then if you're not, listen online. Because do you think, do you think somebody needed to hear this message today? Hear God's word today? I, I believe someone needed to hear that, right? Hopefully all of us, many of us. What if we weren't here? You see, we would have just missed out on hearing God's word today. We could have missed out on the very thing that we needed to hear because we weren't here. That's one of the reasons we take and record our messages so that you can listen and that we don't miss what God maybe really wants us to hear. So I'd love to ask you to make that commitment. Additionally, we're supposed to meet together. We're supposed to encourage one another. When we're together, we can do that. And I know so many of you are, praise the Lord. But I want to encourage you to, to do so. We have many opportunities, ways for you to get engaged here. Many different Bible studies that take place. There's probably six different things throughout the week, almost every day of the week. There's something happening here where you can choose to get connected. Ask us about it. And I pray that you would take that next step to get connected. And then finally, we're supposed to stir up one another to love and good works. <clears throat> Praise God. I, I know that a lot of us, we can, we can do that again, right? Because you guys are doing a lot of this. Praise God. A lot of you are connected in some way. You're here today. And you're already serving. But you know what? What a beautiful thing to discover how God wants to use you and to engage in being used by God. That's a reason to wake up every day. That's a reason to wake up with purpose, to do something that has lasting fulfillment, eternal fulfillment. And I pray, church, that we would. I think these are some great cornerstones of our faith. If we do these things here, as well as read the Bible on a daily basis, man, it's going to bless our lives, bless our marriages, bless our families. And that's the purpose of this word. That's the purpose of this message. And that's the purpose of this church. Let's stir up one another to love and good works. And let's keep meeting together, church, for the glory of God. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would instill in everyone here just what it is you desire of them, God. I pray, God, that this wouldn't be something that would, you know, casually go in one ear and out the other, but, Father, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, impress upon our hearts, leave a mark, God, of what it is that you would desire us to do with what we've heard today so that you could continue to, to further us on in our journey of faith. So I pray and trust you'll do that, God, as we seek you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now I really mean it this week. I hope to see you next week.